you need a Bible right now, we're going to go through Luke chapter 24. Just raise your hand. The ushers are walking forward, then they're going to go backwards. But if you need a Bible, go ahead and grab one and uh, open it up to that place. Listen, we want to welcome you guys who are here in person. We want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel Montrose. If you're listening on radio, we want to welcome you as well. And if you're watching us on our church uh, YouTube, we want to welcome you as well. It's a special service, as you can see, a resurrection service. We are celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. And very early in the morning, about 2,000 years ago, before the sun even started rising over Jerusalem, Jesus, the Son of God, arose from the dead. Amen? That was a very neat and awesome thing. Now, as you can see by this uh, artistic work from... uh, Uh, An author, Peter and John, are overwhelmed. They are running, uh, for in a moment, everything has changed. He's dead. He's alive. He was crucified. He's alive. We saw him. You saw him. I saw him. All this is going on. So the gamuts of emotions are running. We have been in a series entitled, In a Moment, and if you can recall, last Sunday, we talked about the triumphal entry. Jesus was ready to come down, but the people weren't ready for him, right? Right? They missed their opportunity. They missed their opportunity to receive him. And so, at the end, as he approaches Jerusalem, he's sad. He is sad, and he goes up. Well, what do you and I do when we're sad, when we're broken? We seek out Father God. So Jesus goes into the temple, and he decides to teach um, uh, until his death, which would only be a couple of days from there. Then this uh, Friday, we talked about his crucifixion. They did nab him at the garden. They did take him down. They beat him up, they whipped him, they did all these horrific things to him, and they crucified him. But today, we get to talk about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, with your Bibles open to chapter 24, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to read our passage, and then I'll have you sit down. It's only a few verses. I think there's like 110. No, just kidding. Let's pray. Father God, We are grateful that we are one in probably a billion around the world who took the time today and celebrate you. And we do this for your glory, Lord, for we understand, we recognize the price that you paid for us. We thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross, and we thank you, Father, for raising our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And so knowing this now, we celebrate We're going to recall now as we read through Scripture, Lord, that very first morning, Lord, speak to our hearts, Lord. And perhaps for some of us, Lord, teach us again something new as we renew the Scripture again. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 24, reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, God's Word says this. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves and departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then 
the ones whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Now the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these, these things happened. And yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, or beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. And now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they were still not uh, still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Or you're probably saying good riddance, huh? Go ahead and sit down. This is the word of God for us. And this is so that you and I can uh, understand and, and uh, just embrace the things that have happened. So 
we all have something in common, if you may, with these women who came uh, with Jesus from Galilee. Remember, they mentioned them because, yes, it all happened in Jerusalem, but Jesus had like people following him. And women were always kind of getting the food ready, kind of helping out, praying for one another. They were there. There's always a place for women in the church to do whatever the Lord opens the doors to do uh, for them. So they were there, and they were helping, if you may. And they put all this effort, and they prepared uh, 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 the spices and the things to anoint Jesus, as was the custom of their time. So when I say we have something in common with them, how many of us are ready for an Easter dinner this afternoon? Because we've gone, we've bought, we've purchased. How about some of you guys, for your, either your kids or grandkids, are going to have a little Easter egg hunt this afternoon, right? So we get it. The rest of you are duds. None of you guys raised your hands or something. I don't know what's going on here. But anyway, we do these things because it's our culture and it's our custom to honor the Lord, to continue to think of Him and what He's done for us even after the Easter service. So in that, these ladies sacrificed. They, they got these things ready and they came up. Listen, customs are a good thing. For them, that's how they do it. As time passes on, culture changes. America's culture in celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has also become uh, uh, darkened. It is different. I want to share this picture with you, right? These buildings with lighted crosses to honor Good Friday uh, in New York in April 1956. They were not ashamed. The owners were not ashamed to light it up for Jesus, right? Our culture, as I said, has changed. You find a way to honor the Lord, and it's going to be acceptable. This is the way it used to be across America way back in the day. And here's some addresses. Again, it was April 5th, 1956. So the photos show three Wall Street skyscrapers emblazoned with bright crosses. The lights turn on um, inside each building to illuminate the image of what was cherished, right? Our Christian symbol against the darkness of unlit rooms and the night sky around them. Each cross was 150 feet tall. That's back in 56. That's how big buildings were even back then, right? Now, the trio of towers with crosses appears to create the effect of Jesus crucified on Calvary on Good Friday, besides two thieves, if you may. One who mocks the Savior, according to the Gospel of Luke, and the other who repents and asks to be taken into Christ's kingdom. That was the culture back then. So we, we see across time real quick in a moment as we've been talking about how it was for the women who had come, had seen where the body had been buried as we close chapter 23. And then on, Monday, on, on Sunday morning, they get out there as quickly as they can. Today, again, I mentioned you and I having our Easter dinners, our Easter egg hunts or whatever, we're celebrating. And then back just 60, over 65 years ago, how it was in New York City, how they celebrate them. It changes. It will change tomorrow if the Lord hasn't come for us at that time, right? And so they'll be doing things differently. But here's the main point. We will be celebrating the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a good thing. It's back to our scripture. From verses 3 through 8, it states that the women went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So here's a question, right? Was there, was there efforts wasted in that they prepared and the spices and the fragrant oils? Was it, and they bring it to an empty tomb. Was that a waste of time? You know, and some of us say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Ben. You know, they heard the gospel. They knew Jesus had said that the Son of Man must be uh, killed, and then he'll rise on the third day. So what were they expecting to see in the tomb? They should have known. If you're one of those practical persons, Bible students, you're saying, well, they should have known, and I preached that and preached that and preached that, right? But then again, what do we know about the Lord, right? Overall, we know that God always looks at the intent of the heart. And when we do something for the Lord, it might not work out as we thought it was, right? He sees that intent and he receives it. I think there's going to be a reward for these ladies doing what they did on that day. Is it a waste of time? Listen, I take my mother-in-law out to dinner or lunch or something. And people would say, man, the lady, we've seen her eat before. She only eats this little bit of much. That's all she eats. 
She wants to share a plate with Judy, and I hit Judy under the table. Don't let her share. You let her order. You know why? I get it for lunch. I get it the next day. Was it a wasted time? Absolutely not. So even when the ladies come in and drop off the spice and they're ready, someone's going to use it. And even if they leave it there, as we drive on our highways and we see little crosses and we see flowers, they, who, the people who do this, are honoring their family. And the Lord loves it because he told us to love one another and do these things for one another, right? So it is a good thing, right? However, a little application here for us, right? And that is this. If you intend to do something good for someone, do it while they're alive, right? Don't wait till they're gone. If you think, oh, I'm going to bless this family, oh, I'm going to do this and that, whatever it is, for whomever it is, do it while they're alive. Or you might find that they're in the tomb somewhere. All right. Then in verse 4, in a moment, as they were scratching their heads, they're perplexed about the empty tombs, two men appear with bright, shining clothing, right? So we know it's two angels that appear. And so the women, right, they see this and they bow their faces to the ground. The angels ask, ladies, what are you doing here? Seeking the living among the dead? What are you doing here, right? And perhaps now with their heads bowed and every eye closed, I don't know, <laughs> right? As they hear these words, if we could hear their thoughts, they're probably going, uh, 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 right? Then they hear the words of the angels knowing who they are looking for. There's nobody else here that morning, right? He's, they say to her, he, they say to them, he is not here, but is risen. And then here it comes again. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? Church is like the women now hearing this penetration into their hearts and their minds. They say, oh yeah, that's exactly what he had said. And so they remember Jesus' word in a moment. From verses 9 through 12, they return and they began to tell all. But it seemed like idle tales, the Bible says, to everyone who's listening. We would say today, it sounds like fairy tales, right? That he's not in the grave. But in a moment, right, Brother Pete who had been weeping for his denials. Last time we talked about Peter's three days before. And it's during that time when the, before the rooster crowed, he had just denied him three times and boom. So he had ran out. He was weeping. It says, the Bible says that the Lord, they were moving him from one room, perhaps down the hallway, and his eyes looked at Peter's eyes. Peter's eyes, and he's probably thinking, oh no, I let you down. I, I are you mad at me? And the Lord's saying, Pete, I told you this was going to happen. Then I told you after your temptation that when you come back, you will minister to the brethren, right? But Pete didn't catch that part. The Bible says he went away and he wept. But now he's hearing what these women said, what the angels have said. And so he jumps up, right? And he, in a moment, right, he runs. He runs to the tomb. And he's there. He looks inside only to see the bodiless linen cloths lying there by themselves. So he leaves the grave marveling at what had happened. If I asked you what the word marveling means or to marvel, you guys would probably not know. But if I asked my grandson Isaiah about Marvel movies, he would be saying, I know exactly what that means. And I love it because he takes me back 50 years when I watched my Marvel characters. How many of you guys remember reading the comic books, right? Superman can do what? Uh, Spider-Man can do what? All these guys can do what? And we marveled at the things they could do. So if it says Peter marveled, he's saying, oh my gosh, wait, wait, wait. The women came and they said he wasn't in the grave. And he's thinking about it. <laughs> and, and then I went and I saw the grave and it was empty as well. Oh, what, this is amazing. And then he remembers the words that Jesus said, that on the third day, I will rise, right? So it's one plus one plus one is three. I know, you're slow because you had the new math. Sorry about that, right? Three, right? So three days in the grave, he is risen. And all of a sudden, boom, shakalaka. Peter got it. 
He got it. He understood it. He is risen. So that's what this marveling, he's, in the, he's amazed. What could happen? How could this happen? Don't know how, but it has happened. And so he marveled. Then, church, in a moment, verses 13 through 35, Jesus reveals himself to two Emmaus disciples. These guys were on a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem to a village called Emmaus, right? And the guys were discussing all the bads that had happened. Bummer, man. I mean, I, this guy was doing miracles. He was holy. He always gave honor to God. But bummer because our religion talks about our priests, and our priests are the ones that kind of put this thing together to have him crucified. What are we going to do? What do you say? You leave your last church. You're going to go to church. Anymore? These guys said this, but he did that. He talks about going to the Father. They talk about there's only thing you got to do it this way. They were bombed. They were reasoning, the Bible says, and talking to themselves. And so all of a sudden, as they're discussing these things, right, Jesus draws near and he begins to walk with them. And Jesus asked them, what's up, guys? You know, why are you so bombed? And they went on and on and on, as I was just saying, discussing, right? Then in a moment, in a moment, Jesus says in verse 25 and verse 26, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into this glory, enter into his glory? Then, church, in a moment, Jesus gave a a, a little Bible study, and at the end of it, their broken hearts were put together. Jesus fixes or heals the broken heart. When we're struggling with religion, when we're st struggling with what has happened, Jesus healed their broken hearts. And when they had arrived in Emmaus, they asked him, can you hang out? Can you just hang out with us? And so he says yes, and so they sat down, and then Jesus took bread, right, and he blessed it, and gave it to them. Now, in a moment, their eyes were open, and they knew that it was Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus vanished from their sight. Something about, if you're from my generation, when we prayed at dinner for our dinner or breakfast for our breakfast, or when we prayed, we always had to close our eyes. How many of you guys are from that generation? Whenever you prayed, yeah, half of you, three quarters of you. But the new generation doesn't. How many of you guys know that, right? Let's just pray with the eyes open. I sneak and open my eyes when my grandkids are around. And they're looking at the food. They're looking at who's talking. And then they're just looking at the food. And they sometimes signal each other, you know. And, and that's just the way it is. Do you know that the Bible doesn't say that you have to close your eyes when you pray? And if you're driving and it looks horrible, Prayerfully, you've learned to open your eyes when you pray, right? That's not a time to close your eyes. Oh, Father, the seal, Lord, I'm going down veil paths. Ah! You know, don't close your eyes. Please keep them open for the rest of us. But I think the guys then had their eyes open. How do we know? Jesus picks up the bread to bless it. And what are they seeing? Oh, they have just heard him speak about the prophets, what they had said, and he's blessing the bread as when he blessed the bread and he multiplied it and the fish and all these things. He's giving always, Father, thank you, thank you for what you're doing for us, right? And so they probably saw, and it says in a moment, they knew who they had been speaking to, right? And so in a moment, Jesus appears back. He goes back, right? Well, let me go back. I think I missed a part. Da -da 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 -da. No. So the guys rose up early the next day, and it says they trekked back to Jerusalem and found the 11 and the others, right, uh, gathered together. And as they were talking about Jesus, as they were sharing, the Lord is risen indeed, someone says, and he's even appeared to Peter. So we know that situation has gone well, right? But in a moment, verses 36 through 43, Jesus appeared to all of those gathered and says, peace to you, right, and church. The Bible doesn't say that they were scared, right? It says in verse 37 and 38 that they were terrified and they were frightened all at the same time. So Jesus puts them at ease as only he can. And little lesson here for us 
if you're ever uh, frightened, right? If you're ever terrified at the same time, look to the Lord. Seek out the Lord Jesus, the only one who could give you peace. Jesus goes on to show them his hands and his feet, right? Encouraging them to be believers. Stay with your beliefs. Believe. And then he asks the same question that you and I ask every day almost, right? If you look at verse 41, he says, has anybody have any food here? I think that's what we ask, right? So church, of course, he does this so that they can see for themselves that he is the real deal. It is the Christ. It is their friend. It is their Lord and Savior. From verse 44 through verse 48, Jesus gives another little Bible study, like he did for the guys on the road to Emmaus. And he is saying what you have experienced, what you guys just experienced, and what you witness, that is me, your friend, the Lord, being with you, and then going to the cross, dying, and then rising on the third day, has been written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Guys, it's all there, and it's all about me, right? And the lesson for us, when you read your scripture, look for Jesus in the scripture. I don't, you start in Genesis all the way through, he's there. Then, in a moment, verse 45, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Listen. If you ever want to send a personal request up to heaven, something that will be of tremendous value to you, do this from verse 45, right? Uh, say something like, dear Jesus, open my understanding that I might comprehend the scriptures. See, if you don't get it, you'll just read it like a book or the best sleeping pill ever. You'll fall asleep every time you open the Bible, right? But if you... Ask the Lord to give you understanding. It just starts coming out of the pages and into your heart, into your mind, and you're able to grasp what he has for us, right? So it's good stuff. From verse, verses 46 to 48, Jesus commissions them to know the facts. If it's in the law of Moses, if it's in the prophets, in the Psalms, and not for you and I, in the New Testament, know before you go kind of thing, right? He, he says, know the facts so that you can preach that sins can be forgiven in Jesus' name. And to take this message around the world. And since you have to start somewhere, start in Jerusalem. Church, today, again, we have our Bible. Back in these days, uh, Jesus' followers didn't. In our Bible, we have the law of Moses. We have the prophets. We have the Psalms. And again, as I said, we have the New Testament. Likewise, we are in our own Jerusalem, right? Manchos could be your Jerusalem, right? Ridgeway could be your Jerusalem. Olathe can be your Jerusalem. Log Hill can be your Jerusalem. Delta could be your Jerusalem. Cedar Ridge could be your Jerusalem. Jail can be your Jerusalem. It can be, right? You, people get saved in jail. How many of you guys know that people come to Christ in jail, right? That's why I think Peter <laughs> spent a lot of time in jail. So did Joseph, right? So did the Apostle Paul. And he was always having a harvest, harvest, always in the jails. So absolutely, right? Or in a rehab place. Yeah, people get saved in rehab. Believe it or not, I know, I'm amazed that the Lord would say, hey, excuse me, guys from church, you go ahead and have your service. I'm going to rehab. Someone has to get saved today. And in the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, people come to Christ all over. So the lesson here in Jerusalem, he says, we have to start somewhere, so start where the Lord has you. And finally, in verses 49 through 53, Jesus says, guys, before you leave your Jerusalem, wait for the promise of my Father. And if you note here, again, the word promise, right? The word promise is capitalized, and we have learned that when it's capitalized in such a manner, it is a reference to deity. So we understand then that Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit as the promised one from God. You should not leave your Jerusalem without being endued with the power of the Holy Spirit from on high. Then the Lord takes this short walk again, little two-mile walk to the edge of Bethany. And he raises his hands again, and he blesses them. And in a moment, 
but it's a moment that everybody sees. He begins to ascend up to heaven. I'm sure that everybody's there is kind of like, well, wait a minute, I took theater 101, you know, and where's the cables pulling them up? Where's the trick? How's he, is there a piston somewhere down there that's pushing him up? No, he's on a cloud, but we call it the Shekinah glory, the cloud or the cloud that filled the temple in the old days, right? And he's being lifted up. In one of the other gospel, it says that two angels, young men, right, it calls them, right? They kind of like go around and they're looking at the faces of the guys because everybody's watching them go up and they say, guys, what are you gawking at? How can we just gawking, right? Do you not know that the same Jesus who is being taken up will in like manner return to earth, right? Oh, it just filled their hearts to have heard this. They in turn, and we have been doing this for over 2,000 years, they worshiped him and they returned to their Jerusalem with great joy. And we're continually at their church here, temple, right? Praising and blessing God. And then we say, amen. That's your chapter. That's the word of God right off of Dr. Luke's gospel. It's amazing. I'm going to ask our worship team to come up. Listen, we are going to close in prayer, of course. This is an exciting time for us. Best not leave your joy here at church that he's risen all day today. I, I love it. The kids are going to find their, their little eggs, and we're going to be talking and kind of bringing it in to the things of God. Then we're going to enjoy dinner, as most of you are as well, hopefully, prayerfully, right? And, and we're, we bring things of God to it. But if there's anyone here, anyone at all, that doesn't know, is not sure that when Jesus sounds that trumpet, you know how it says, the dead in Christ rise first. If you don't die with your sins forgiven, if you don't die knowing that your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life, then there's this hesitation. In fact, you'll be one of these people, and I told you as a chaplain, I, uh, five years here at Montreal's Memorial, a few years back, the ones that had the hardest time finally letting go is the ones that are not sure of where they will spend eternity. If you are here today and you're not sure where you will spend eternity, I want to pray for you right now. You see, if you ask Jesus, if we were to say, Jesus, let me just ask him, Jesus, would you forgive anyone right now if they ask you for forgiveness of their sins? What's the answer? Lord, would you write their names down in the Lamb's Book of Life if someone was to ask you to do so? Would you do it? What would he say? The Lord loves you. He went on that cross and what held him was not so much nails, but love in his heart for you. And if you have not accepted that love and accepted him and asked you, save me, Lord. You might have saved my mama. You might have saved my daddy. But you don't get in because you're family. No one goes in on coattails of someone else's. It has to be, I believe, I don't care if anyone else doesn't believe. I believe that you died for me on Calvary's cross. I believe that you went to the grave and you were there three days on behalf of me because you paid for my sins. And I believe on the third day you rose again. You rose again and these guys saw you. I believe these reports that are written in the word. So it takes you to say... I want to make a decision today for Jesus Christ. I want to do this. Before we pray, is there anyone here that would say, Pastor Ben, pray for me. I don't have that assurance right now. And before I leave this place, I want to have that assurance. Is there anyone here at all that would say, I need to do this on my own right now? Without your mom, without your wife, without your husband, without anyone else, you. The question is for you. Is there anyone else that would say, pray for me? Jesus says this. If you deny me before your fellow man, I will deny you before my Father and the holy angels. That's just the bottom line. And people don't know because they're not in the book, right? He also says, but if you confess me in front of men, I will confess your name in front of the my Father and in front of the holy angels. It's your call. Religion doesn't get anyone to heaven. 
That's why the guys were confused. What, what, what do we do? Jesus gets you to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except you come through me. No one. There is no one else that could get you into heaven. Only Jesus can. Your choice. Anyone at all. Last call. You guys are familiar with last call? Remember that? Two o'clock in the morning, some of us? Oh, God have mercy. Last call for Jesus Christ right now, this opportunity. Anyone at all? Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity. And now we pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless as you bless the ones gathered in your name back in the day, that you would continue to bless. We know that you are, Lord, all across this world. You're honoring those who honor you, Lord, and you will. We look forward to the day when you return for us, Lord. But in the meantime, help us to serve you, Lord, with our complete heart. We love you, Lord. We give you the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen.